during this pandemic, I send out a weekly devotional on our church's prayer chain for people to use it each day. This past week, the theme was, Come, Follow Me. One day, the scripture reading was from Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 34 through 42. Let me share those words with you that come from the lips of our Savior. Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own family. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Good morning, and welcome to the worship service of the Vine Fellowship Church in Copley, Ohio. My name is Mark Rupert, and I'm the pastor of the church, and we are so glad you decided to worship with us today. If you're a member or friend or a new friend, we'd love to hear from you during the service, so please share your comments as we worship. And if you do not have a church home, please consider us your church home. And also, if you're in need of pastoral care, please call me here at the church. Now, please join me in our call to worship. Gaze into heaven and see the glory of God. Lift up your eyes to behold the risen Christ. God is our rock and refuge, a strong fortress. Christ leads us and guides us every day. Indeed, you have tasted the goodness of God. You have known the presence of Christ, God's chosen one. Every day we long for pure spiritual milk. Every day we are inspired by the living Christ. Then let us lay our troubles at Christ's feet. Let us enter the sanctuary God prepares for us. We have come to find the way, the truth, and the life. We are here to ask and to receive and serve. Let us worship God. our doubts and questions as excuses for irresponsibility are called to account. 
We have disobeyed God's word and rejected the one who revealed God's love. Because we do not believe, we cannot see the goodness of God. Let us seek God's mercy and forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. We confess that sometimes we have covered our ears so we cannot hear your word of judgment, holy God. We seek to isolate ourselves from a world in pain. We become enemies and persecutors of Christ who identified with poor, needy, and oppressed people. We reject the one you sent as the way, the truth, and the life. We do not pray as Jesus prayed, trusting you hear and respond. O oh God, deliver us from ourselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of hope. Let not your hearts be troubled. Whoever believes in God will not be put to shame. If you truly believe, you will show care for others. When you care, you will join in doing the things Jesus did to help all the people God loves. You are chosen to proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of the shadows into God's marvelous light. You have received the mercy of God. Amen. to 
Will you pray with me? O God of heaven, you open our eyes to your glory. We see Jesus who stands by your side. It is Jesus who allows us to come into your presence, and he intercedes for us when we know not what to say. By his very sacrifice, he tore down the curtain that keeps you at a distance because of the disobedience of your people. He showed us how much you love us and how you desire that we be kept near. In him, you restore our confidence. You will not forsake us or you will not cast us away. And so we approach you with assurance and with boldness. You have called us a chosen race, O God. And so keep us mindful that you chose us for service and that it is your will that we must obey. And when we are arrogant, let the needs that surround us make us humble so that your commandments may be obeyed. O oh God, you have ordained us your royal priesthood set apart for ministry. Help us to use the talents you have given us so that others may feed on the bread of life, Jesus Christ. You have named us a holy nation, and so we plead your forgiveness when we forsake your redemptive society for our own patriotic zeal. Guide us as we take seriously our citizenship in your sacred order. Help us to ex exercise our electoral rights to the benefit of all those who remain powerless and without a voice. You bestow a title upon us as we inherit in Christ the name of your people. Let us not look with disapproval or suspicion at the honor or take lightly the task that it implies. The Spirit empowers us to respond with obedience, and by that guidance, we seek to be faithful. We pray this day for those from our church and those who are friends of our church, for Mia and Pete, Stephanie, Jacob, Frank, John and Eileen, Danielle, and Kim. We pray for the family of Bud who passed away on January the 16th in Florida. Bring comfort and resurrection hope to his family and friends. And we pray for our friends, Fred, Justin, Pat in North Carolina, Shirley in Pennsylvania, Doug in Pennsylvania, who has been recovering from COVID-19 and is now receiving dialysis, and Gary in Chicago. We lift up all those who are serving on the front line of this pandemic, those who have lost loved ones, those who are suffering with the virus, and those who have been affected in various ways. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris as their administration begins their four years of office. Great God, give them wisdom and understanding and the wherewithal to govern effectively and to be able with the Republican counterparts to work together for the good of your people. And so we pray all these things, remembering as Jesus taught his disciples when they prayed together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading comes to us first from Psalm 8 and then from the New Testament from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. First, Psalm 8. Hear the word of God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then from the New Testament, from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Jesus says this, And it's very close to the time when he will be betrayed. He has been in the upper room washing the disciples' feet. This is the conclusion of his public ministry. Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Here ends the reading from God's holy and precious word. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, open up our ears and help us to listen. Lord, open up our eyes so that we truly might see Jesus. Amen. One day there was a street preacher who asked a passerby a question. Brother, have you found God? The preacher asked. Now, the passerby just so happened to be a follower of Jesus, and so he looked at the preacher right in the eye, and he answered, I never knew God was lost. Now, for those who believe in God and for those who believe that God has made himself known in various ways, and the most important way is through God's Son, Jesus Christ, the believer knows that the problem is not that God has or ever will be lost. Rather, the problem, or rather the question is, are humans lost? And the only way we can try and find our way is in and through Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've ever been out riding around and and you've 
come upon a church and and there's this sign in the front of the church, the church marquee, and on the church it might have a very cute saying. I remember years ago I saw on a church marquee this. If God seems far away, who moved? If God seems far away, who moved? You see, I love what the passerby said to the street preacher. I never knew that God was lost. The trouble is, some people see and feel that God is far away, that God is distant from them. He's not involved in their concerns, their issues, not involved in their lives. If you go to the Old Testament book of Job, the 23rd chapter, verse 3, I'm going to share words that I'm sure we can all identify with because, you see, maybe we have been in Job's sandals when Job cried out, Oh, that I knew where I might find God. But then the person could also ask, Okay, so you say you know God, but how? How do you know God? And I don't care if you're a believer or a person who is seeking and trying to understand God. This question is something we have to be able and willing to wrestle with and come to terms with. How do you, how do I know God? Divine Fellowship Church is a Presbyterian church, and so our roots are what is, are known as the Reformed tradition. As the Presbyterian Church was birthed out of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. As a matter of fact, it's said that if a Presbyterian goes home, <laughs> they go home to Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh, Scotland, where John Knox held a Reformation in that land. And so today I want to look to our Reformed faith to address this question. And to do so, I want to turn to a very old document, a document called the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was written all the way back in 1647, and it helps. It actually helps in answering our question. For in the Westminster Confession of Faith, it states, God is known by the light of nature and the works of creation. And so we can say that God is known through creation. And once again, we can turn to the Westminster Confession of Faith, for it also suggests that God is known because it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church, and afterwards to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary. In other words, God makes himself known through his holy and divine word, the scriptures. I want to share with you today two theological terms that I believe can help us to answer our question, how do you know God? And these two terms are general revelation and special revelation. But first, let me say a few things about general revelation. Have you ever woken up on a bright, sunshiny spring or summer day with a breeze blowing into your bedroom through the windows and the sun streaming in, and you have taken in the wonder of God's creation? Or maybe you've been to the ocean and you've looked up into a sky that is cloudless and a beautiful powder blue. And you've looked out into the ocean and you've watched the waves that have formed far out into the distance only to come crashing onto the beach. And you thought about how did all of this come about? And for those of you who are parents, do you remember the first time you held your newborn child? You stared into his or her face. You gazed upon their tiny features. You counted all their toes and their fingers. And you wondered at the creation of this newborn. 
Well, general revelation is the self-disclosure of God, which all people can perceive by looking to the world of nature, history, and human life in general. The knowledge of God that comes from general revelation is called the natural knowledge of God. And when it comes to general revelation, there is this, shall I say, movement, a movement that occurs from human beings to God. In other words, it is human beings seeking after God. And we do so by looking at the universe in all of its splendor, looking at history, looking within ourselves where we can find a spiritual awareness of a divine presence. But I also mentioned special revelation. Special revelation, it refers to the unique self-revelation of God through his mighty acts in the history of Israel and above all, in Jesus Christ, through the Bible, and through the Christian church. And this knowledge of God that comes through special revelation is called the revealed knowledge of God. And this is where the movement of theological reflection is from God to human beings where God seeks to find human beings, and God does so through Holy Scripture and through God's Son, Jesus Christ. But let me bring us back to general revelation and spend some time as we seek to find God through nature and through works of God's creation. I want to focus on empirical evidence or, or evidence that comes through experience or observation. Our first scripture passage from the Old Testament, Psalm 8, it is where we read of the greatness of God and this all-powerful creator who cares for his most valuable creation, you and me. We also read in verses 1 through 4 of Psalm 8, Your glory is higher than the heavens. When I look at the night sky and see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place. Let me share with you now three points. Three points that give evidence through experience or observation. Point number one. The universe shows forth a purpose that is divine. I mean, think about the human body, how intricate it is, the various parts and how they have to all work together just right so that the body functions properly. Our breathing, our eating, our digesting of food, the removal of waste from our bodies, how we move and walk and whatever else goes along with these bodies of ours. But then also think about the earth. Think about how the earth turns on its axis, how the earth moves around the sun at just the right distance so that life can exist here on earth. That just didn't happen by accident, did it? There must have been a creator who had a tremendous purpose in order to make all of this, right? The famous George Gallup once said, and I quote, I could prove God statistically. Take the human body alone. The chance that all the functions of the individual would just happen is a, st a statistical monstrosity, end quote. It was years ago that astronaut James A. McDivitt, who orbited the Earth 63 times with Edward H. White II aboard Gemini, Gemini 4 all the way back in 1965, who also was the commander of Apollo 9 in 1969, he said at the Foreign Press Club in Rome this, and I quote, 
I did not see God looking into my space cabin window as I do not see God looking into my car windshield on earth. But I could recognize his work in the stars as well as when I walk among flowers in a garden. If you can be with God on earth, you can be with God in space as well, end quote. Point number two, looking to ourselves. We see support for the existence of God and a spiritual awareness of a divine presence. Unlike the animal world, I believe there is in every person an inerrant knowledge between right and wrong, otherwise known as a conscience. Recently, in 2017, there was a team of researchers at Yale University's Infant Cognition Center, and their research led them to conclude that babies are, in fact, born with an innate sense of morality. And while parents and society can help develop a belief system in babies, they do not create one. These studies show that even before babies can speak or walk, they judge good and bad in the actions of others because they are born with a rudimentary sense of justice. So wrote Whitney Virginia Morgan in an article she wrote on October the 6th, 2017. You see, in my mind... This only proves a wonderful, moral God who is at work in the world and at work in our lives. And taking this one step further, I believe that we are made. We are made to be rational, moral, and physical beings, but there is also this spiritual component to us. Now, we might not be able to fully explain the presence of the Spirit of God, but we are intuitively aware of it. It's like the contemporary song by Plum. There's a God-shaped hole in all of us. And point number three, a reformed understanding of general revelation. You see, back in the 16th century, those early reformers believed that general revelation cannot presume what special revelation can and must be. They believe that when you and I look at nature and the works of God's creation, what we see can only give us a glimpse, a glimpse of an incomplete knowledge of God. Looking at God's creation can reassure us that there is a God and we can learn something about God's power and wisdom and might, but this knowledge is not enough. This knowledge is incomplete. And that is why we must look to special revelation when it comes from the full knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. It comes through a knowledge of understanding God's word, and it comes through the church. It was the late Dr. Shirley C. Guthrie, Jr., who was a minister of the Presbyterian Church, our denomination, and he was the J.B. Green Professor of Systematic Theology at Columbia Theological Seminary for nearly 40 years. He said it so well when he put it this way, and I quote, All Christians agree that in the last analysis, we know not because we can prove God's existence or because we can show that man needs God or because we have searched for God and found him but because he has come looking for us and made himself known to us. We know what God is like not because we have decided what he can or must be like on the basis of our speculations about him, but because he has told us and shown us what he is like in a special way. And this special revelation gives us a special knowledge of who and what God is like, end quote. And God reveals himself to us in this special way in three ways. First, through history. Second, through the Bible. And third, through the church. 
And at the center of each of these ways, history, Bible, church, is the person of Jesus Christ. And this is where our passage from John 14 comes into play. John 14, 1 through 7, it makes it crystal clear that Jesus is the key. That Jesus is the center. He is the focal point, and he points, he shows us who God is. The scripture passage is the night of Jesus' betrayal. He is gathered with the 12 disciples in the upper room to celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus tells them of the believer's relationship to the glorified Christ. He tells them of eternal things, of, of heaven and his father's house with, house with rooms for all. He tells them of permanent, everlasting fellowship with him. And yet, even though there are rooms for all, access to God is only through Jesus Christ. He says again in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there is both general revelation or the natural knowledge of God where God reveals himself to all people as they either observe or experience God's existence in the world of nature, history, and human life. And this is where people are found seeking God there is also special revelation or revealed knowledge of God where God reveals himself through history, through the word of God, and through the church, and it all points to Jesus Christ. For special revelation is where God seeks you and me and finds us. Finding God. God finding us. And the question is that once we have realized that there is a God, once we see evidence of God in nature and creation, once we realize that God reaches out to us through God's holy word and through the church that Jesus Christ established, the question is then, what are we going to do with this knowledge? And if everything ultimately points to Jesus, what are you and what am I going to do about Jesus? For if Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by him, are we going to receive him as Lord and Savior? Because you see, it's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to know Jesus in a personal, real way just like we know about President Biden. But how many of us actually know him personally? My friends, God has found us in Jesus Christ. So are we going to find God by accepting his son? We see only you and only I can answer that. But we can through a prayer. We can through a prayer. It's as easy as a prayer. And it's as simple as A, B, C. We're in that prayer. We say, I acknowledge that I am a broken, sinful person, and I need Jesus. And I believe that Jesus, B, is the Son of God who came to take away my sins and C, I commit or I recommit my life to Jesus. Acknowledge, believe, commit. I pray that we do. I pray that we receive him. Amen.
thank you for worshiping with us today, and we hope you'll come back next Lord's Day. And as I say every Sunday, I, I pray that you stay well, you stay safe, you stay virus-free. I also ask you to reach out to others. Reach out to someone who might need love today. And pray for our country. It's a new year. There's a new administration. I ask that you would pray for those who are in authority. Come back next week and join us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.